So as a short introduction, uh, welcome again to uh, the weekly security seminar. I'm just delighted to finally be able to introduce uh, Ira Winkler. Ira and I have known each other for, um, we measured in decades. Uh, and, and Ira is one of the, the best known people uh, working in, in security, particularly in areas of human aspects. He's a noted lecturer and speaker. It's hard to go to any major conference without uh, hearing him, him talk there. Author of several books um, and just a, a wonderful resource in the area of actually uh, applying security. So with that, um, you can find out lots more about him online if you're curious, but uh, he's worth listening to. And, and Ira, please take it away. Okay, thanks. I'm honored. What can I say? So anyway, let's talk about, you know, what I consider the problem because, you know, human security engineering, I want that to become top on people's lips because right now, if a user makes a mis right now, if there's an awareness problem, everybody says, oh, it's an awareness problem. I go, the problem is it's not an awareness problem. It is a system problem. It is a problem of the entire system. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. But generally, the problem is in safety science, if a user injures themselves, then everybody says, oh, it's not why did the person injure themselves, it's why did the system allow the person to be injured and why did that injury propagate, as an example. In accounting, and I'll give you this example, if a CFO ever walked into a board meeting and said, hey, you know what, we just lost $20 million but that was because a user did something they shouldn't have. We can't blame the user. Oh, you know, we can't. And, and then the CEO would interrupt him. He's like, you know what? We can't blame the user. We blame you, Mr. C CFO, because you were responsible for implementing systems that don't result in $20 million losses, as an example. So anyway, keep that in mind as I progress and hopefully my slides are working well. Um, so let's talk about the Twitter hack first. In the Twitter hack, everybody was there and everybody, you know, when it was announced, what did Twitter say? Twitter came out with a press release of some form. It was written by a tech guy and they just described it as a highly sophisticated social engineering attack. And it's like, okay, and what did they do? What did Twitter say they were gonna do? They were gonna implement better awareness training. Now, I hope there was more, but you know, essentially what they did was, here's what essentially happened with the Twitter hack as far as we know at the moment. Some mastermind who turns out to be a 17 year old kid, and frankly, I'm not downplaying the, the fact he was 17 years old as a kid and being a criminal. I'm downplaying calling someone a mastermind who is 17 years old. I mean, I hate to break it to Twitter, but I could tell you that GRU, China, Israel, the US, whoever else has much more better masterminds than this. You, they should be embarrassed by the fact they call this person a mastermind. But anyway, what the person did was they essentially created man in the middle attacks where they essentially said, okay, we're gonna try to log in as somebody. They went ahead, there was multi-factor authentication. They sent an email link to the person in some form doing a phishing attack saying, we need you to authenticate yourself. The person appeared to authenticate themselves. The criminals basically intercepted the code the person was entering onto the system and then they entered the code and then they got that person's access on Twitter. They found out that there was a central repository that contained the set of tools that allowed people to reset passwords. And don't worry, Twitter had it all nailed down because only a thousand people were able to access that set of tools. So clearly 20%, just limiting it to 20% of the population to change President Obama's password who has 100 million plus Twitter accounts is clearly a highly sophisticated thing. Of course, it wasn't highly sophisticated. It was a systematic problem built into the entire security issue. Yes, it was a little clever that the person did a vishing attack to a certain extent, but just because a person gets somebody's access, it doesn't mean they should change a whole bunch of high profile accounts just because they have random access to a tool. And just in case anybody says, oh, well, who could have foreseen? They should know that uh, it was two years before 
some person left Twitter who was a temporary employee and he was not very pleased with um, you know, Trump, Donald Trump and he deleted Donald Trump's account on the way out. So clearly they knew there were errors in the making in this situation. Anyway, um, so next, so the 17 year old mastermind, social engineering, phishing, tools, thousands of people. Next, we have Cloudflare. And what happened with Cloudflare was, and this had nothing necessarily to do with security, but it had everything to do with security and the human aspect. What happened was for those people who remember, and most people don't, there was a major outage of Cloudflare, which provides a lot of internet data across the world. And so what happened was the CEO got on his Twitter account and said something to the, the effect that an engineer was essentially responsible for misconfiguring a table. The table then led to the outage. And somebody tweets back to the CEO and they basically said, oh, I would hate to be that engineer. And the CEO, much infinitely to his credit, said, it's not the fault of a single engineer. This failure was a failure of leadership because anybody who was able to take, you know, the fact that a single error was able to take down their network, that's a failure of the entire system and therefore a failure of the leadership of the company. And let's see, so moving on and why I highlight those two, you know, um, count juxtaposing those two, you know, those both happened at about the same time, very different reaction from the company. And when I do parallels, old school safety science, like I did in the pseudo introduction, you know, at the time it was, why did the user do what they did? Why was the user so stupid was essentially the cry of safety science practitioners. Then um, the next thing was, there was a focus on the proximity of the error. In other words, where the error occurred, they say that's where the solution has to be. And it was always analysis of why the user was wrong. They never stopped to look at what were the contributing factors to putting the user in that position or whatever else. And I kind of look at it and, you know, when you look at Sidney Decker's work, and for those of you, you know, if you really want to take a deep dive or even a little dive into the field of safety science, you could go to YouTube and see some of Sidney Decker's um, online courses. He has some great ones on new school of safety science and so on. But anyway, he has the analogy that basically, you know, it used to be that if a canary died in the coal mine, the, the saying was, oh, we just need healthier canaries. Likewise, in cybersecurity, that's our attitude. You know, if somebody injures themselves in, or somebody make clicks, you know, clicks on a phishing message and ruins the network, they say, we just need a more aware user. Again, that's like saying if a canary dies in a coal mine, we just need healthier canaries. That is not the problem. The purpose of a canary is dying in a coal mine in that case. You don't want a canary to die from old age or something like that, clearly. But at the same time, you don't blame the canary for the gas in the coal mine, nor should you be blaming the user because they click on something. And, you know, here's the, you know, in operational problems, you know, when we talk about, you know, mechanical breakdowns, like why did, um, you know, proximity doesn't explain a lot, you know? So for example, in mechanical breakdowns, just as an example, when I had a generator that I would use when the power outage happened, you know, one time the generator blew. And why did the generator blew, blow? Because it blew a gasket, why? Because I was a genius and never checked the oil level. So it was out of oil. The problem wasn't that I went ahead and started the engine. The problem was that nobody was doing preventative maintenance. Yes, that was still me, but it's me in a different place in time. There should have been preventative maintenance in place. Same thing with like, for example, buses. You don't blame a bus driver if the brakes of the bus fail and the driver does everything he possibly could to save the bus. It's a failure in the maintenance. In medicine, every time somebody dies in a hospital, they have regular meetings to cover. Why did this happen? What happened during a, a surgery? that, you know, for exa example, a doctor prescribed or like an anesthesiologist put in the wrong type of, 
you know, drug into the person's system or too much of the drug. And everybody's like, oh, well, the problem is you put in too much of the drug right there. No, when you look at medical errors inside complicated environments, they realize that there are a set of events that happen, you know, that happen like a thousand actions might happen during an individual operation. And an error almost became, you know, imminent when a, when a doctor went down a certain path. And then the question is, why did the doctor go down that path? Because at the time, the doctor didn't just make, in all, most cases, the doctor just doesn't make a stupid mistake. The doctor did the best decision available to them at that time. So again, what led to the doctor making that decision at that time for that reason? That's how other fields look at the problem. And then coming back to a new school of safety science, you know, the way we should be looking at cybersecurity, the user is as much a part of the system as the computer. You know, a safety incident results from a failing of the entire system. You have to look at what are all the enabling factors. And the user in many cases is just the proximity of the error. And the proximity of the error is not the cause of the error. The proximity error is the inevitable symptom of the error. If you can't breathe, for example, sorry, this is a bad case with the latest news events, I wasn't applying for COVID, but if you can't breathe and you're in a hospital, they have to know, oh, well, you can't breathe. Why can't you breathe is the right question to ask. Not just the fact that a person can't breathe, you have to solve the underlying problem. You know, Solving the immediate problem is one thing, but if you really wanna prevent cybersecurity incidents, you have to solve the underlying problem. And again, a user error, clicking on a phishing message is only what's wrong, is only a symptom of what's wrong in the entire system. And I'll cover that. Now let's look at the Boeing 737 MAX. I think they're starting to come back into production. When the two 737 MAX, Max jets crashed, they essentially nosedive, nosedive into the ground. You know, you had pilots, the pilots couldn't get control of their airplane, and everybody from the start was like, oh, this is clearly pilot error. And you stop and wonder, why is it pilot error? You know, and, the, and you ask, could the pilots have saved the planes? The answer actually is yes. But the problem is, it wasn't just, well, if the pilots knew exactly what to do, then clearly they would have known, done it. The problem was, could the pilots intuitively figure out? The fact is a lot of pilots did figure it out, but you can't single out the pilots. The reason the planes nosedived into the ground was because at some point in the production process, Boeing said, hey, instead of making a whole new generation of jets, and what I mean by that, Boeing has, for example, 737, 747, 57, 67, 777, 787, and so on. They said, instead of making a 797, for example, we're just gonna upgrade the 737. And so they started upgrading it. They took the frame of the jet. You know, 737 was a very, very safe, stable plane. And they had to move it around a bit to accommodate more people. They had to move the engines up. They were lower to the ground. It caused a variety of different things that caused the balance of the plane to be different. So the software controls were modified. And more important than just the balance in the software controls, they took the sensors and modified the sensors. They basically said, hey, you know what? There are these AOAs on the side of planes and these angle of attacks say if a plane is going up or a plane is going down or something to that effect. And what happened was they kind of adjust. And if there was a problem with that AOA, it would make it look like the plane might be going into the ground when it wasn't. And the way ironically you stop a plane from going into the ground is to pick up speed. And the way you pick up speed is by aiming the plane down, which then generates lift and you know, causes the plane to go back up. That's kind of the Bernoulli principle, I believe it's called. Um, Spath can tell you about this later, perhaps better than I can. But anyway, these AOAs were faulty and every time the pilot tried to pick it up, this autopilot would put it down. And so the right solution was to turn off the autopilot, but nobody ever said that. Nobody ever trained. Nobody ever told the pilots that, by the way, the sensors don't work in the 737 MAX jets the way they work in the traditional 737s. 
and the training wasn't updated. They said, well, the jets, the, the new ones are so similar to the old ones. They just have to like kind of read a, you know, read a pamphlet or something to that effect. So it was a systematic failure and the pilots were just part of the system that were not trained, that were not engineered in the right way to catch it. So no, it was not pilot error, even though if they figured out how to do things right, perhaps they could have made it. So now here's another thing, you know, I'm telling you a lot of stuff and, you know, to a large extent, you've been fed a bunch of ignorant crap, the way I call it. You know, everybody loves to mention, oh, we're creating the human firewall. We're going to make the users our last line of defense or the first line of defense. And why? Because that all sounds great. You know, that all is focusing on the proximity of the error and the human firewall as well. Users make mistakes. Let's be the, you know, let's fix the proximity. Again, by now, you know why that's a failed strategy. And even more important, when you look at the user as your last line of defense, do you know how screwed up that is? Do you know how much we failed as an industry in cybersecurity if the user, given all the other technologies, your last line of defense? And let me tell you why. What happens if the user's malicious? Everybody talks about awareness and the human firewall, like the user is well-meaning. The user isn't always well-meaning. Sometimes they're apathetic. Sometimes they are overstressed. Sometimes they have competing things, but sometimes they're just outright malicious. What happens if you have a sociopath as your last line of defense as a CISO or cybersecurity professional as a whole? You have failed massively. It's what I call bro science. Somebody picks up a book on like Caldini's book on influence is really big for people in the cybersecurity awareness space. And it's a, you know, it's a decent book that says how to influence people. Now, at a high level, you think that's, you know, great. You want to influence your end user. That's kind of specious thinking because really, when you think about it, this is psychology, not organizational psychology. Because a social engineer, yes, a social engineer wants to basically influence a person at a time. You, as a cybersecurity professional in a large organization, you're not going to a user one by one. You have to go to everybody. You don't, if you, if you somehow have the ability to out touch everybody individually as they want to be influenced, great. But if you're the normal cybersecurity professional, you have to influence people with very limited resources and you're not going to get to everybody. You have to figure out how to create a culture. And it's not just, and a culture is influencing the whole organization behavior, not an individual behavior. And hopefully you understand the difference. Anyway, but most of these, again, focus on the proximity of the error. Now, let me ask you this. All these people who say they're creating the human firewall and speak accolades about the user, they always say that the user is never at fault. But you know what? If you're focused on the user and the user can fix the problem, isn't the problem that if the human could fix it, then you're actually saying by default the user's at fault if they don't fix it? So again, that's where the problem occurs. It's hypocrisy through ignorance. Anyway, so now I have Newman here. Hopefully you all know who Newman is. In this case, you know, this isn't a Seinfeld talk. This is actually just, I needed a cool picture for accounting and surprise of surprises, there are not a lot of cool pictures depicting accounting. So anyway, I found this thing of Newman. Newman, in this case, is just doing accounting. And the reason I highlighted it, much like I said, you know, the accounting field has been working on user error more than computers have been in existence. They have put processes in place that say, hey, you know what? A user will make mistakes. You know what? A user will be malicious. A user might not know the process. A user will just be ignorant, they just might not care, whatever the thing is, and they don't care why a user does something they shouldn't. They have established processes in place that basically define what a user does, how they do it, what they should be doing, and then implementing audit processes after the fact to ensure things happen. And then when there is some sort of loss that is measurable and concerning, they go back and implement forensic audits to figure out what happened, how it happened. They never go back and say, oh, gee, you know, maybe we just need better user training, or maybe we just need it to be funny because embezzling from the company should be a funny thing. And again, hopefully you see 
my attitude on funny, funny can be nice, but at the same time, funny can trivialize a critical subject too. So you got to do it well. But anyway, the other thing is stop and think. I don't know, you know, your staff students, most of you, I don't know how many of you might have to fill out a page or, you know, time card at some point in time to get paid. If you have to travel, you have to do travel reimbursement. When I would travel for large companies, nobody ever said, hey, you know what, those travel vouchers are really hard. If you don't want to do it or you don't get it right, don't worry about it. No, if I left out my $4.56 Frappuccino receipt on a $5,000 travel expense report, my whole expense report was sent back. And nobody ever said, oh, poor Ira has to pay his credit card bill of $5,000, but they won't, you know, but they want a $4 receipt. And that's so hard to get all the receipts. Nobody ever says that. Why? Because it's accepted that this is part of your job. This is how we do business. If you don't want to keep the receipts, then you don't get reimbursed because they need the receipts for their purposes because fraud happens, mistakes happen. So they want to make sure it's all accounted for, even though they spent much more in their accounting processes than my $4 Frappuccino. The reality, though, is that these processes are in place because they also catch the larger either mismanagement, mishandling, or malfeasance. So anyway, here's scuba diving. A lot of people, well, most people wouldn't know it, but I'm a master scuba diver trainer. And when I train students, you know, you know, I stop and think, and fundamentally, I'm going to step back. The first time I ever heard the expression, you can't, C-A-N-T, stop stupid, was when I was doing my instructor training. The course director, he was telling us, it's like, look, no matter what you do, somebody's going to do something stupid. You can't stop stupid. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know what? Our whole instructor training is about stopping stupid. You know, what are the procedures? What are the safety protocols? What do students do? The whole dive industry could not exist if we didn't endeavor to stop stupid. So for example, before we put students, you know, take on students, they have to fill out a health questionnaire. You know, we have to put them in a pool and make sure they're not gonna freak out in the water. Does it, do we care if they swim? Not really. We just wanna make sure that they won't freak out because you don't need to swim because you have dive equipment if you do it right. So then we go ahead, then we give them, you know, about dozens of hours of training, you know, mostly online these days, where they then have to take a test to make sure, and all that training is pretty much to make sure that they know how they should not kill themselves. Then once they're ready to go inside a, um, a facility and get in the water, we take them to a pool. The pool is, you know, never more than 15 feet deep. We, however, still start them out in the shallow end. We check out their equipment. We tell them to check out their equipment. We put it on, you know, we make sure that the equipment's safe and secure before we put them in. Then we put them in the low end. Then if they're comfortable, take them slowly to the deeper end. And then if they could do everything there, then we take them back out into open water. And the open water or platform like you see on your screen is going to be no more than 30 feet deep, usually around 50. 15 feet deep, you know, as good visibility as possible. And then even then when you see here, this is like, you know, I assume this is an instructor trying to test people on a fin pivot because you could see the person that is, um, I don't know if you see my cursor, that looks like the instructor who's working with a student trying to get them to do a fin pivot where they just basically hover up and down. He has to look at one student at a time. And I wasn't doing something like this once. And I had one of my br brilliant students decide, let's look under the platform where they could essentially wedge themselves in and kill themselves. But anyway, I saw them at the corner of my eye. But more important, when I'm, when I'm doing something like this, you should see over there, there is a, the, the, let's see, is the red circle there? Um, hopefully the red circle appeared, it's covered up on my screen. But anyway, you should see there's, a, there's an assistant instructor or dive master that a good instructor brings with them that hovers around looking for things because you know proactively an instructor won't be able to watch everybody at all times, so you bring help. And then even with all this happening, we have insurance for the school, we have insurance for the instructor, we have insurance for the facility. If there's a boat, we have insurance for the boat. If there is, you know, even, we even take out a policy for the students that they mostly don't know about. We know where first aid is, oxygen is. We have basically implemented risk management into the entire scuba instruction process, which makes it safer than bowling in general. So now when you look at where blame falls, 
90% of the blame, and this is back to safety science, when somebody injures themselves in safety science, 90% of the failure is in the environment. For example, a hammer might fall off a table on somebody's foot. Um, I was once working with a manufacturing organization implementing an awareness program. And they were telling me, it's like, well, we used to have forklifts in the warehouse that would run into people because people and forklifts could go wherever they want. So finally, they just said, you know what? They did a big study. Then they said the best solution, big yellow lines down the center of the warehouse aisles. People stay to one side, forklifts stay to the other. Cut out almost all the, all, all the accidents they had, just drawing a line down the at factory floor. What was the last 10%? That was the user error where somebody might have been careless. That was when somebody, for example, would be on their iPhone and kind of wander aimlessly into the path of a forklift or the forklift driver was somehow careless, not looking where he was backing into or something like that. But that's where blame falls, 90% on the environment. Even with fishing, and I'll throw this out because I'm probably gonna go into it later. Even with fishing, why does the user fall for fishing? Was the user stupid? Let me ask you this question. Why is the phishing message in the inbox in the first place? People have to be asking that. For a phishing message to be in that inbox, that means that a whole bunch of technology failed before the user is given a chance to fail. So keep that in mind as we go along. What's the last 10% though? Carelessness, blatant ignorance, lack of training, malice. You know, this is kind of where awareness and training could fit in, kind of, but it's still only 10% of the problem. I know Sirius is supposed to be interdisciplinary, so let's talk about the concept of applied behavioral science. And in behind, implied behavioral science, you know, there's broad ways of looking at it. I like this way of looking at it. In other words, why do people behave the way they do? You have antecedents. Antecedents are essentially information provided, you know, by you, your awareness program. What guides people to influence a behavior? And then once a behavior happens, there's a consequence to all behaviors. There is a consequence. The consequences can either be positive, negative, or neutral. So let me ask you a quick question. What is the benefit? Because a quick cybersecurity example, we always tell our users, don't reuse your passwords. You know, don't reuse your business password. Don't reuse your personal password on your business account. Don't reuse your business password on your personal accounts. But guess what? We tell them this, and that influences about 20% of the behavior. Then everybody knows they shouldn't do it, but you know what? It's kind of annoying to keep lots of passwords. So what do they do? They go ahead and they reuse the password anyway. What is the consequence for that? 99.9% .9 of the time, there are no consequences. And guess what? That makes the consequence actually positive. And the reason it's positive is because they have to learn one less password. So that way they're more likely to reuse the password again. And this consequence is 80% and so on. You know, the only time people get burned is if somebody actually, you know, their passwords end up getting, you know, hacked off one site, get put on, you got pwned or somewhere like on the dark web, and then it gets compromised in that way. For example, I don't know how many people remember the, when the ring accounts were compromised, where some bad people, they basically went ahead out on, the dark web, they found user IDs and password combinations through a bunch of compromised accounts. And they said, hey, here's the bank, you know, here are bank credentials that were compromised. What's the likelihood that somebody at a given bank is going to have um, a ring account? So they just went ahead and started taking those password, user ID, password combinations and fed them into ring. And guess what? They got access to people's accounts and they were able to talk to people's children, insult people, steal cameras, screenshots, all that sort of stuff. Then they got the consequence. Then they said, hey, maybe I should actually implement better security. That's the consequence, rarely does it happen. But this is why awareness programs usually fail because they fail to create the consequences that you need to really drive behavior. Because the purpose of an awareness program is to drive positive security behaviors. So anyway, let's move on to different science, different science, um, counterterrorism. In counterterrorism, one of the biggest things is the concept of boom. In cybersecurity, some people in the, out of the defense industry tar, start talking, we got to move left to boom. What does left to boom mean? Left to boom really just means prevention. 
they want to focus more on prevention. But let me tell you, you know, what, you know, it's great to prevent attacks as soon as you can, but you still have to plan for the attacks in progress. You still have to plan for the reaction to the attacks. So let's talk about how this applies to, again, the concept we're talking about of human security. So talk a counter, you know, basically in left of boom, you're doing things like pre prevention, protection, you know, and so on. And what that means is, for example, if we're interested in stopping terrorists, prevention might be hunting down the terrorists and trying to stop them, trying to stop the terrorists. Then you have a different group of people who say, you know what, I have a facility. My facility might be under imminent attack. I'm going to figure out how to harden my facility. Two different groups of people working two different aspects of the problem. Then we have the concept of boom. How do we mitigate boom? How do we go ahead and stop boom in progress? And that might be, for example, in the case, and, and this is actually a bit of a security success story inside a bad event, but 9-11 you know, is iconic for the World Trade Center, but the Pentagon was hit at the same time. People remember the World Trade Center better because that's where more people died. It's more visual and so on. Ironically, though, the Pentagon is a bigger office building than the World Trade Center was. But what happened was inside the Pentagon, in the months before, they decided to make it more bomb resistant. They put in bomb resistant walls, they put in more segment, they put in more metal to stop imminent explosion damage and so on. So they were able to mitigate the attack in progress. They limited the damage. Then you also have to plan for response recovery and counter terrorism and things like that. The response has to include, well, let's make sure we have the appropriate people in place like the medical teams, but we also have to make sure the medical teams are trained to respond appropriately. Like for example, check for poison gas, radiation, secondary bombs, and so on. Then there's a recovery, you know, how do we get things up and running again really quickly? And then resilience, how do we get things hard and how do we make sure this doesn't happen again and so on. That's what happens in counterterrorism. Now, let me go on to another concept that I think I'm the only person that created, but that's user initiated loss. And here's why I call it user initiated loss. It's not user error. And also the other concept is, why do I call it initiated loss? And I'll start with that first. Initiated loss, if a user clicks, does something, they are initiating a potential chain of events. They are not causing the da they are not causing the loss. They're not causing the damage. They are initiating damage. In other words, if I click on a phishing message and that phishing message contains ransomware, if, for example, there is anti-malware on the system, the damage will be mitigated because it, hopefully the system will not allow the user to implement malware on there. If the user doesn't have permission to download software in the first place, they don't have admin privileges, it won't execute or most ransomware won't execute. But anyway, just because a user does something, it doesn't mean loss is initiated. If a user deletes the file, the user isn't deleting the file. The user is clicking an action telling the operating system, I want the file deleted, but the operating system can stop the file from being deleted. So anyway, they are just initiating the potential loss. And that potential loss can be initiated either through ignorance, carelessness, malice, any related issue. It doesn't matter why. Because if I say user error, I'm implying a motive. I'm, or I'm implying a lack of motive. But either way, as a cybersecurity professional, you should not care why an action was you know, initiated. You don't care what the reason is. You just know a user has the ability to delete files. A user has the potential ability to be confronted with ransomware. A user has the ability to send out data. Just because they have the ability, it doesn't mean, again, you don't care why they're sending out a file with information, at least not you know, for the purposes of stopping it. You might do that when you're trying to do an investigation after. But you need to un just understand, you don't need to sign motive, you just need to see they're initiating the loss, and it doesn't mean the loss is going to be realized. You want to mitigate the loss after it's initialized. In other words, you want to stop damage from happening. So anyway, when, in order to stop user-initiated loss, looking at left of boom, first thing I recommend is preventing the user from being in the position to initiate it. In other words, why is the user in the process in the first place? Does the user have to be in the process? Look at governance. Can we take the user out of the decision-making loop?
can we stop the capability? For example, you know, when you start looking at, um, you know, help desk personnel, a help desk personnel really needs to see the actual credit card. If you don't give the person the credit card number to look at in their query screens, they won't be able to steal it as an example. So that's just one example. But anyway, also in Left of Boom, create a culture of consequences. You know, for user actions, you know, if everybody wears a badge, everybody will wear a badge. It doesn't matter whether you have an awareness program. And let's say nobody wears a badge, but you have a funny video that says why you should wear a badge, nobody's gonna wear a badge. Make sure you have the culture to do, you know, to make people do the things because everybody does the things. That's the most secure way of doing it. And users may aid in detection, they may see something in the process and so on, so that's great. Next, more important is governance. Governance, people so often overlook this concept in cybersecurity. Everybody looks at it as a set of documents, like what you give to the auditors. Governance should say how a process is laid out. What capabilities do users have? What is the process that a user is or is not gonna be a part of? You know, what are the actions by default? And governance should then start to include, if a user is to make an action, how should they make that action? That's a critical aspect. Governance really just says, okay, users will review emails and users should report. But what does reviewing email mean? You know, you can't say a user's stupid if you never gave them any way of actually doing it. There's no such thing as common sense without common knowledge. And you have to give people the common knowledge and common knowledge should be defined by governance. Anyway, at the point of boom, the user is prevented, presented with the opportunity to initiate a loss. And in this case, what do they do? Do they detect it, prevent it, sound the alarm? You know, and you also have to consider what's the user experience? Are you guiding the user in the right direction? A lot of emails um, servers today, for example, they will say this message originated from outside the network. Ideally, they should say this link goes to the wrong, you know, does not go to where you think it goes and so on. You know, you can give people guidance in how to do it. I'm using phishing as just an example, but hopefully you can see or extrapolate how it can be used in other scenarios as well. But remember, the user is presented with the opportunity, what do they do? You know, again, carelessness, willful, you know, so you have to figure it out. Now, again, this is where policies and governance comes in because I kind of look at most organizations are creating Elmer Fudds. Hopefully you all know who Elmer Fudd is. If you don't, I hate you. But anyway, Elmer Fudd is a Disney, uh, not a Disney, is a Warner Brothers, if you heard of Bugs Bunny. Again, if you don't, never heard of Bugs Bunny, I hate you. But anyway, Elmer Fudd was always trying to hug, hunt Bugs Bunny. And what would happen is Bugs Bunny would hide from Elmer Fudd. He would put on a dress, he'd put on a wig, he'd do something. And Elmer Fudd could never recognize Bugs Bunny if he was in some sort of disguise. And most cybersecurity awareness programs are creating Elmer Fudds. They're basically saying, watch out for that hacker. Those hackers are gonna try to trick you. They're gonna try to do this. And every time a user looks at an email message, like, is that a real message or is that a, you know, or is that those hackers that are social engineering me? You don't really care. A user should not care. At the end of the day, the only thing the user should do is like, hey, I have this email message in here. What is the appropriate way I should respond to this email message? If it says it's from an executive, if it says it's from a known party, are they asking them to do things that are within, you know, the overall permissions that the user has things to do. Instead, awareness programs are just relying upon, watch out for that tricky hacker. They're gonna try to get it. So now, um, hopefully you've trained people. Now in Write a Boom, the loss has been initiated. Does your environment expect it? For example, if users don't have admin privileges, when a user clicks on a phishing message, the user can't really damage the system. They shouldn't be able to install malware from running. If a user doesn't have permission to connect to certain outside systems, they can't go ahead and do things. Does the system have, for example, data leak prevention in place? So if a user sends out sensitive files, are there web content filters that are looking for a user being enter credentials on some web system around? You know, so what you've got to do in write a boom, planning for write a boom, you have to figure out what are the actions a user can take 
and what, how can you proactively determine what they are? How can you proactively harden or making the system resilient to prepare for that inevitable harmful action and mitigate the harmful action? You have to really think about that proactively. And if you don't, this is more important than a user clicking on a message. Because whether the user, if the user clicks on a message through lack of awareness, it doesn't matter. According to the Verizon data breach report, you know, or even going to more historical things, 3% of people are sociopaths or psychopaths. That 3% of your user population will do you harm if given the opportunity. And it doesn't matter whether there's an awareness failing or not. That will happen. You have to anticipate the harm any user might cause, and that's what accounting people have done throughout their entire, you know, throughout the history, well, where they've got to these days. Most important, if you have an incident, go back. Why did the incident occur? What caused it? What enabled it? You know, proximity, again, is not the cause. Also, I like to recommend, I don't have it here, but maybe you got lucky. Maybe uh, there could have been more harm if the user got into a different system, if the user somehow did something different or whatever. Maybe they caught the phishing message and it was caught in progress. So near misses or something you also have to look for as well. You know, what caused it and how could it have been worse and what could you have done to make it better? All this sounds difficult. Everybody says, that's a lot of work. I got to do this. It's like, well, safety science does it. Accounting does it. If there's an outage or some sort of issue in operations, they look at it. So anyway, cybersecurity should be the same because cybersecurity is supposed to provide business, a business function. And you've got to look at it as a business the same way everybody else does. Now, when you think about it, 90% of incidents result from some form of user-initiated loss. You know, shouldn't that be part of your strategy, you know, that you can use for your organizations? You know, do you currently analyze things or just slap countermeasures around? What I mean by this is right now, the user problem, as we refer to it normally, the user problem is being handled by a set of independent tactics. Somebody says, you know what? I need kind of filtering messages for my, I, I need filtering software for my email. Somebody says, well, we also need awareness and maybe phishing simulation, so let's just do that. Somebody else might randomly say, well, I need data leak prevention, I need anti-malware, but nobody is looking at this as a strategy. Human security engineering should be considered a discipline that provides a strategic look at the human problem. You know, how does a user do this? What are the steps from start to finish? It's embarrassing. Every other business discipline looks at things as a process. They look at the problem as from a strategic perspective. In cybersecurity, we're still looking at the user problem as a tactic, as an awareness. And yes, you might need, your awareness program might have a strategy of itself, but it's just a strategy in the middle of an independent tactic. You need a tactic for the bigger problem. The bigger problem is user-initiated loss. So if I'm gonna go ahead and we're, well, I don't know when tax season is anymore. That kind of got lost in the process, but let's just, for example, say a lot of businesses have the, pro the problem around right now of sending out W-2 information. Actually, it's more January timeframe. And it's a common fraud example where bad people look on LinkedIn and say, hey, who works in an HR department in you know, mid-sized companies? And then they send a message saying, hey, I'm the CEO of the company. Hey, Mr. Low-Level HR person, I need you to go ahead and send out all the W-2 information to our new accounting firm. Then what happens, the people send it out, happens to thousands of organizations every year. From a human security engineering perspective, how that should be done is we look at the problem, okay, well, the problem coming in originates from some sort of phishing message. For all, for all security, we have mail filtering going on strategically. And if we're going to let an email message through, we're going to tag it. So maybe we tag it as an external message. If you tag it as an external message, then at least when the user looks at it, say, hey, why is the CEO coming in from an external account as an example? And then the message says, hey, Mr. Low-Level Person, I need to go ahead and I need you to send this out. Now, the low-level person shouldn't be saying, hey, is this one of those social engineers I saw in that awareness video, or is this really the CEO? That should not be the question a low-level person asks. What the question should be is, the person question should be, hey, 
I am getting a message asking for the release of PII related information, which W2 information is. What is the process for release of W2 information? The process is that, hey, I need to go ahead and all requests for PII need to go to the head of human resources, who then has to go to the head of the, the, the general counsel and or the head of privacy. And they have to review any release for PII. So the low level person shouldn't be sitting there thinking, is this the bad guy or is this the CEO? They should be thinking, okay, I need to forward this to the head of HR. And then so be it. And your awareness program should be a reinforcement of that process. That's what awareness should be. So anyway, well, but let's say that fails because eventually it will fail no matter what. Maybe the social engineer will trick that general counsel. You know, congratulations to them if they do. But whether they do or they don't, the next thing that should happen is there should be like, hey, I'm going to send this data out. And when you try to attach it, somebody should say, wait a second, you're trying to attach PII. Do you really want to attach these files before you send it out? And then the user says, well, this is the CEO. That's not a tricky hacker. And then when they hit send, data leak prevention software should stop it from going out. But that's a holistic way of looking at this one problem. But think of the overlap. The whole guidance of handling PII is not just for this one scenario. It's good for every, you know, all different scenarios involving PII. Data leak prevention stops a, a whole lot of stuff. Filtering of incoming email, tagging of email, warning of attachments, all that can stop a whole bunch of different types of losses, either malicious or malignant in nature. And again, if you can mitigate 90% of these countermeasures just by stopping user initiated loss, you're probably also going to stop even the things that don't involve the user as well. Awareness is still mandatory. A lot of people say, oh, you seem to hate awareness. No, I, awareness is critical. But here's the concept. Awareness is not a silver bullet. Awareness should be what every other security tool is. Awareness is a form of risk reduction. And when implemented well, awareness will be a valid form of risk reduction, just like all those anti-phishing anti filters that, that failed in the process. Yes, awareness will fail, but you should have other processes in place to also verify and check this out. But awareness is still critical. Anyway, but more important, are you throwing around a set of topic, tactics or are you going to pursue a strategy? You need to pursue a strategy like a science in mitigating user initiated loss. And safety science, they call a science. But let's call, you know, I call it human security engineering because it sounds more advanced. <clears throat> Social engineering sounds so much better than conning people, which is essentially what it is. So let's call human security engineering is a better way to handle the user problem. But again, the most important takeaway if you get nothing else out, you know, you're not trying to create healthier canaries. You're trying to create a healthier system that stops the canaries from dying in the first place, not going ahead. And whether the canaries are strong, whether they're weak, whether they're old, as long as they're not just dropping dead randomly from old age, you want to keep them alive. And the users, again, if they make an error, it's a failure of your whole system, even if it's outright malicious. Much like, again, the CEO of Cloudflare said, you know, it's a failure of leadership if you're going to have a major problem and you're going to blame the user on it. So anyway, I have my new book, You Can Stop Stupid. It is awesome. Spash should have it as a course textbook. Hint, hint. I doubt it, but have to at least throw it out there. Anyway, uh, available on Amazon.com. And that's how to reach me. <clears throat> um, any questions? I think somebody came up. What? Uh, <laughs> well, I have no idea about the transcript, anonymous attendee. Um, okay, reading Garab's message, to my understanding, tra um, trade off of usability involved when making a system more secure. You mentioned systematic changes and more programs engineers would mitigate the effects of. Uh, okay, for business. How do you balance the two, usability and security, moving towards one? It, that's not necessarily, let me, argue, let me contend, and it's not, I'm, what I'm saying is not always correct, but in general, good security can create a better, operate, more efficient operating environment. And yes, security when done 
Sometimes security will stand in the way of business processes. For example, it might make, you might have a critical situation where you have to send a file to somebody that's critical. You know, for example, you might be an engineer working inside a company and your email filters stop.exe and, you know, tar files and other sorts of, um, you know, data compression files from coming into your company. So in general, there, I acknowledge that it can be the case, but usually good security should make things more efficient. It should speed up your network and so on. So for example, if your email filters are filtering out email messages well, you're not gonna go ahead and get a thousand messages in somebody's inbox. That's all gonna be filtered out. You know, there are cases with it, um, but you know, you have to have a balance. It should not be that security wins. It should be like, there's an expression I use, security shouldn't be the department of no like it's perceived. It should be the department of how. And if you have a valid business function, the job of a CISO or anybody on the cybersecurity team should say, okay, I appreciate that we have a security concern. I also appreciate more important that we have a business concern that we have to address. So you should go ahead and proactively address the business case and make it better. In all honesty, these days, a lot of security is ubiquitous and invisible to the user. And we want to go ahead and continue that ubiquity. We want to embed things into the process. So for example, you know, I use accounting as an example because expense reports are a time sucker. I've had expense reports that my filling out the expense report was longer than some of my trips, but it's looked at as a necessarily evil. Time cards, time, you know, filling out your time and your reporting time reporting systems, again, is a critical business function. Nobody argues with that. So again, I would say, try to be the department of how more than no, consider usability. But again, if there are, you have to understand that security is likewise a critical business function and you have to try to address the usability, but it's not necessarily always a balance of the two. If you implement secure, most, most security well, the usability might even be enhanced. So I'll leave it at that. Are there any other questions? Well, uh, we'll wait here for another few minutes, Ira, but you provided a terrible fire hose of uh, information <laughs> there for us. Um, so I, I think people may, may be uh, trying to let that soak in a little bit before coming up with something. No, I appreciate that. I, I, I will be honest. I rarely do I get too many questions. Some people say I'm, I might be intimidating. Some people just say I threw an entire encyclopedia because I think I covered at least five or six different fields in a single presentation in this case. But well, I think, I, I think part of your point is good because I've been saying for a while um, that security engineering, we've, we failed at a lot of it, that looking at safety engineering may be better because uh, however a failure occurs, and we may not know the cause, we want to prevent the bad effects. And, mm -hmm. and so rephrasing the question is probably going to get us farther for some things. And, and that, I, I realize it doesn't cover everything you talked about, but uh, uh, we're in agreement on that part of it. Yeah, because just to add to that, here's the issue with safety science that we have failed because we don't have good return on investment studies in cybersecurity. So in safety science, if a user, or uh, sorry, not a user, but if, a, if an employee injures themselves on the job, there are very, very large potential losses incurred. So if, for example, somebody, well, you know, I have clients in the oil gas industry. Let's just say somebody accidentally blows up an oil processing facility. Hopefully that never happens. But you know, there are major losses. If you have to take down a facility, an operational unit, there's like potentially millions of dollars a day to be lost. If you have to shut down like 
you know, like, let's say you have like Ford Motor Company, they have a, you know, like a, what do they call it? A factory line, I forgot the term, but you know, they, they have the line shut down because somebody's injured, that costs them millions. So safety science, there is a tangible measurement in the reduction of injuries and how much money that saves. In cybersecurity, we're suffering death by a thousand cuts and never adding it up properly. So every time a user loses a USB drive, yes, there are the major incidents that happen, but companies aren't looking at it at the micro level. And if people would take the lesson from safety science and say, wait a second, there are lots and lots of losses we could mitigate if we look at it holistically with a strategy, which is what safety science has reverted to, and not just a set of tactics, which is where we are with cybersecurity. Uh, maybe then we'll begin to have the impact we want to have. Yeah, well, yeah, some of the incidents that we have, like the um, uh, solar winds incident, e even even adding up what the costs are, there's there's just no way to do that. I think uh, as you're talking about a petroleum plant, uh, very instructive in the literature is the terrible tragedy that occurred at Bhopal mm -hmm. um, that put the the company in bankruptcy as well as killing uh, thousands of people. And, and part of that land is still uninhabitable de decades later. Uh, yeah. Preventing those kinds of accidents in the physical realm, we care about, and we seem to have ways of measuring and testing. We just don't apply them to software. So yeah. your, point, your point is well made. Yeah, and, and we don't have to go into that because that really does require, I mean, that they had some of the best accounting minds in the you know in in the business figuring out what are the losses what are the benefits and we're not going to get those people to a large extent yeah we have some of it like the people in the solar in solar winds are going to figure that out or maybe they won't they'll just say well we took a big hit ah uh, let's go ahead we'll hire some people who sound famous and look good and we'll paint a happy face on our brand image and stuff like that but um in cybersecurity, most companies don't sit there and actually calculate out the amount of loss they have. But again, more important, they're not looking at it strategically. Everything is a set of tactics because there's no thought leadership. We have the vendors telling us what to do. And when we're dealing with the user, every like you look at it, every awareness company has said, oh, awareness is broken for the last three decades now. And we have a better way to do awareness because our awareness is funny, which they've been doing for three decades. But no, all, but the vendors are driving the thought process. We need CEO, CISOs to step back and say, here is how the thought process should be. It is a, it is a major problem that requires a strategy, not just listening to vendors, but looking at it in a systems perspective the way I look at every other, the way every other department in the organization looks at themselves. So Ira, we've got one more question in the Q&A and let's make this the last one uh, and we'll finish up at this point. So go ahead and give an answer to this. Okay, what are my thoughts on the, the recent Tesla car crash where everybody was sleeping? Um, it's unfortunate. Um, <laughs> When I look at that, obviously that is a case that does Tesla no good. And Tesla is going to go back and re-engineer their software to figure out where it happened, why it happened, where were the blind spots. And Tesla, because they have so much at stake, given the regulation and everything like that, there's so much money involved. Um, my thoughts are that a little bit, so there are two thoughts, and let me say it that way. One is the bigger thing. Tesla is going to fix the problem. The other problem though is, are we just gonna have people like when they first came up with the um, cruise control, there was a case where somebody had a motor home and he bought new, brought a new motor home and then he gets on the highway, puts it in cruise control and then he takes off his seat belt and walks to the back of the motor home thinking cruise control will let him keep going down the road, didn't realize the limitations. In this case, there's going to have to be some sort of issues with this where, te where Tesla is going to build in the safety functions because they don't want to be shut down. So they have a billions of dollars on the line. So they're going to solve that problem. And they're going to have to, for lack of a better term, 
when I say stopping stupid in my book, I'll just leave the, this thought. Stupid is not, you're not going to stop a user from behaving in a stupid way. However, that doesn't mean you, you're not responsible for stopping the impact of the stupidity. And by not doing that, you're the stupid ones. But in this case, Tesla is going to have to go ahead and figure out how do we address this sort of problem? Are they going to put motion sensors inside the car to figure out if people are nodding off as, a, as an example or something similar so that doesn't happen again? But they have hundreds of billions in motivation to figure it out, so I, I'm assuming they will. Well, Ira, thank you so much for spending the time with us, and we hope you can come back at some point where you're in person and actually get to meet some of the faculty and students close up. I uh, love to, but thank you. Yeah, and people, uh, if you're interested in, in more depth, perhaps at a more leisurely pace, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, you know, look up Ira's books online, uh, and, and you can certainly look into those. So thank you again, Ira, and uh, everybody in the seminar, we'll see you next week. Okay, thanks everybody, appreciate the opportunity.